people are always looking, always have been looking for something beyond, something that uh, that is beyond this life. That uh, people have always wanted to say, this can't be all. This isn't all there is. There must be another dimension somewhere. Making the Omega Factor was quite interesting from the point of view that we had uh, one or two incidents, shall we say, that occurred, which could be interpreted uh, one way or the other. Why did that bulb go? Why did that clock stop? Why did that Ouija board tip over? I mean, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether, uh, you know, we were being haunted or we were being told we shouldn't be doing this. Rod Graham, who was, uh, had then just gone up to take over as head of drama for BBC Scotland, I got a phone call from him saying, do you fancy coming up to Scotland and uh, directing and, and producing the second series of The Standard, which was their, it was a newspaper uh, series starring Patrick Malahide as an investigative journalist, uh, which BBC Scotland were doing. And I said, yeah, great. Uh, uh, I'd worked with Graham, uh, with Rod on on Z cars and various other things. And so I went up to, uh, to do that, and uh, we were in, I was setting up the second series when I uh, was told, we were told, we're not doing a second series of the standard. It, it wasn't, it hadn't been the success that they'd hoped. So um, Rod called me in and we sat and he said, right, well, we've got slots, we've got some money, we need to fill them. Have you got any ideas? <laughs> And in a way, that was where the Omega Factor came out. You know, that's that was the birth of it. So it was a question of, and I'd always I'd always been interested in the paranormal, um, that whole area of uh, stuff. I, you know, as a student, I'd, you know, done the Ouija board and all. You know, I've done all that, and uh, so I thought, well, there's a possibility here. And and I took to Jack. Jack Gerson was a, a writer in uh, a Scottish writer then, quite you know, he'd done quite a lot of telly, and I had a, I was talking to him about it, and he also had uh, you know he'd been thinking along s similar lines. I've always had an interest in the paranormal. I read a great deal of books about it, both fiction and fact. I won a play competition for television in Scotland, and then uh, I got into writing for series like This Man Craig, Sutherland's Law. And uh, the Omega Factor was just an idea that I, I was fascinated by. The idea was to try and combine uh, a realistic uh, a situation where you had a, a department, university department investigating all these uh, phenomena and, and add a, a thriller element to it. The idea was to make a more or less a thriller out of it, but at the same time, look at it quite, you know, in a serious way. A certain amount of it probably was factual, and a certain amount of it was a, what might have been factual. I managed to get a, a hold of Dr. Archie Roy, who was then a professor at uh, Press of Psychology at uh, Glasgow University, and it was a particular interest in of his um, parapsychology was and and related matters was, was an interest of him. He also wrote, had written several books on the subject and uh, I, so he was very kind in terms of, I, I, got, I went and had chats with him and he got, he got quite into it and quite involved and was prepared and gave me a lot of uh, ideas for stuff. Um, and he also said he was quite happy to not vet the scripts, but I, so he read all the material, all the scripts as they, you know, when they were submitted. I was commissioned to write for The Omega Factor by in fact, Maggie Allen, the script editor, who had been a protégé of mine uh, in, in a previous existence on the troubleshooters, and, um, and also, of course, by George Galaxy, the, the uh, producer. And um, I was very happy to pick up the, the idea because it was a, seemed to me to be a, an exciting idea, a chance to do good things and uh, make some interesting television and to uh, do something that that had some thought behind it. The casting of the, of the leads was actually quite important. Um, James Hazeldean was the, that was the initial one. He was my first choice. Um, I didn't, uh, 
I, there was nobody else I thought could play this part. I mean, in, in a way, it was. I tried to craft it, write it more or less for him. I'd never worked with uh, with James Hazeldean before. Uh, I did afterwards, happily. Uh, he worked for me, or w worked with me rather, on uh, a series I did for Thames Television uh, called Chockey, which was originally uh, a dramatisation of a John Wyndham book. And um, then we went on to do two spin-offs of that, Chockey's Children, Chockey's Challenge, two six-part serials, uh, in each of which he played the father of the young boy who was the principal character, and was marvellous in them. He was a lovely man to work with, and I found him a very good actor to write for. Um, very straight, very direct, um, very unassuming in many ways, but uh, uh, you know he had no no side to him. He was uh, um, humility is not, not the right word, but he was he was slightly diffident, I suppose, in many ways. Um, but he was a very rewarding character because he was aware of what was going on. He was uh, was receptive, and I think he made a very good job of both of uh, of both parts as far as I was concerned, the, the dad in Chockey and, uh, of course, the, the lead in the Omega Factor. Louise, um, I'd worked with Louise on Doctor Who, so I mean, I, I knew her and I, I knew her personally and, and, I, and she, you know, I liked Louise. She's a, she had the right sort of mixture of warmth and sense and for, that, for that character and, and she, she went, she worked, I thought she'd worked very well with Jimmy. Um, John Carlyle was this sort of outsider, I mean, I uh, I had seen John in a few things, but he was a but he to me he was a sort of classical, act, you know he had that sort of classical actor thing about him which I was looking for in Martindale and you know the professor, because he was all I, he had to be ambiguous he was sort of painted as the slight was he the villain was he behind it in terms of the thriller element, I was trying to tease the audience into saying well you know. Is he, which side is he actually on? And John is brilliant at that. You're too involved, personally. That area is out of bounds to Ukraine, and you know it. Thanks very much. Dr. Reynolds at least knows how to obey orders. She knows that this department hangs on by the skin of its teeth to its appropriation. HMG, the civil servants, and the rest don't like us. Don't believe in what we're doing. Party tricks, one minister described our work as. Party tricks that drive people out of their minds. Party tricks that kill. The three regulars, you know, were damn good professionals in their own right, but they weren't so professional that they played it for themselves. They always took into consideration the fact that there were two or three newcomers. And they gave them the benefit and the help that they could. So I was very happy for them. And happy also because I could leave them alone. Just they could get on with their own parts, and they didn't need much from me. But then again, a director doesn't need to give regulars many notes. They know what they're doing. They know the series. They fit in. Directors, um, I because, again, I keep going back to this thing: the fact that, that we were working under such pressure. I had again, I was relying on people. A either directors I knew or I'd worked with who could turn up, the, you know, we're not going to turn up and say, darling, I need five weeks to do this, you know. I mean, it was just a question of getting, get in there, get it done and, you know, give us a good, good job. I suppose in those days, what, late 70s, everything had a ridiculously short time. If you were working on any form of series or episode of any form of series or serial, it was always strapped for cash and therefore strapped for time. So you, you had to fit in, but there was a kind of, uh, there were parameters and you knew how far you could go and you knew what the limitations were. And as far as the Omega Factor episode five, which is my one, was concerned, yeah, we had an extra, um, pressure on us because we were doing outside broadcasts. We were going out in the evenings and we were going out to church yards and we were going out to tenements and we were dragging with us lots of equipment, lots of uh, extra jennies and, and, and lighting and, and, and so on. So the pressure was probably greater than it would have been had it been a straight uh, sort of uh, unit situation in the studio.
Hang on. Stop the car. I saw Drexel's girl. Moran. I had this big thing about not wanting to be seen to be in my father's television series. So I actually made up a false name and uh, George Galaccio helped with this. I don't know whether he remembers or not. And we went in to see the director, Paddy Russell. I can't remember what I called myself. And I had this interview and it was only after the... Uh, I got the job that I confessed that I was the creator's daughter. But I'm not sure whether she knew or not, but it made me feel better. Um, so I, d I just didn't want them to think that I got the job because he was on it. Well, basically speaking, I think uh, if you were writing a 50 minute episode of something, uh, you generally didn't have more than 20 minutes on film. The rest was a studio, and you wrote for the studio. You may have had bits of film in between, but uh, that was basically the idea. I'd been used to, I mean, the, the, the standard uh, shooting for exteriors on uh, in any form of uh, BBC drama at the time was to shoot on 16mm and cut it into the VT, the videotape, on the, on the, in the studio. Now, that was always very unsatisfactory because of the difference in quality. But by the middle of the 70s, we had been using outside broadcasts, i.e. videotape, quite a bit in London, probably not in Glasgow. But at least when we came to Glasgow, we had one extraordinary advantage. They hadn't been doing it for very long, if at all. But what they did do was give us the same camera crew for the interiors for the studio as they did for the outside broadcasts. Now the particular advantage there was that whereas back in London when we did interiors in the studio and exteriors either on VT or film, you always had different crews. Therefore, the outside broadcast crews wouldn't be familiar with the cast, would probably not be familiar with the story. And therefore it was it's a bit difficult to sort of, uh, you know, convince them where the characters were, where they were coming from and so on. Whereas in Glasgow, we'd been shooting in the studio, then we went outside and did outside broadcasts. And all the crew, you know, the Sparks, the PAs, the cameramen, the sound men, everyone knew A, the script, and B, the characters. So we never had that hiccup, that problem of trying to sort of convince them that, listen, you know, Teach them the new, teach them the story. It was there, and there was a continuity. On episode one, I was supposed to appear in front of a car and make Jimmy Hazeldean's cause a crash, which resulted in the death of Joanna Tope, was playing Jimmy Hazeldean's wife. Well, I thought they'll take a shot of me in front of a car or something, so I sat on the bus on vacation for about three hours, and there was a very strange little man who stared at me all the way through it, all the way through dinner. We had dinner on the bus. He didn't introduce himself. He eventually came up and he spoke to me and he said, I'm the stunt driver. And I thought, oh, that's great. That's brilliant. That's nothing to do with me. So at about half past nine at night, out I went and we were at riding school just outside Glasgow. And the director, Paddy Russell, who I believe did Doctor Who before that, I was very comfortable with Paddy said, right, Natasha, she said, stand in the middle of the road, it was pitch dark. She said, when you see the car coming round the corner, just walk towards it. Feel free to jump out of the way if, if you think it's getting too close. So this car, and he was a brilliant driver, came round the corner and I suppose 30, 40 miles an hour is not fast, but it, it stopped about a foot from my hips. And then they had to do it again because there was something wrong with the sound. And there was a cameraman at BBC Scotland who talked about that and tutted for years. But I had a great time because I, I was wheeled off into the bus 
and given vodka and tonic and stuff and hot soup and I would have done anything because it's my first job. I just wanted to make a good impression, but it was actually quite scary. Actually, if you look at it, it's not all that impressive. I'm sure they could just have done it by taking a shot of, of me, but it entertained everyone at the time anyway, and it was quite exciting. <laughs> There are quite a few oddities happening during the making of this series, and particularly the Powers of Darkness, which was the episode about uh, the occult, witchcraft, etc., etc. Um, the clocks in the studio, for some reason, stopped functioning. That, that was, uh, I mean, you could put it down to bad maintenance, but uh, it did actually, uh, they, they, they weren't working very well. And we had several um, technical hitches on that one. Um, cameras weren't responding as they should. Um, so, I mean, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether, uh, you know, we were being haunted or we were being told we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, all the way through the series, I wore a dress I hated. I was taken out by the wardrobe mistress and it was very girly and I was 18, 19 and did not want to look girly. And it had little yoke and it was woolly and it had little puffed sleeves. At the end of episode five, um, everything was being collected, the people who weren't in the cast anymore. And Catherine Westry, who was a lovely lady, came, came into my dressing room and she said, I can't find the woolly dress. Because I, I think I was wearing something different for the very end of it. I, I wasn't wearing the woolly dress. And she said, Natasha, we would have given you that woolly dress if you wanted it but um, you could have asked. And I said, I didn't want the woolly dress. I haven't taken the woolly dress. <laughs> they never saw the woolly dress again, so I suppose that could be counted as something supernatural. The woolly dress disappeared because I can't imagine anyone wanting the woolly dress. And I used to get kids shouting morag at me in the street when the series was going out, and where's your woolly dress? They actually shouted that. So no one would have wanted that dress. I don't know what happened to it. The thing is that the Omega Factor of episode five had in built into it this uh, peculiar situation of Ouija boards and night shoots and churchyards and interiors of churches and dead crows and mystical figures, supernatural, appearing out of, uh, you know, above pulpits and um, rather sort of obscure, distant, vague tenements and staircases and everything that we were doing, apart from one or two very ordinary scenes in the studio, had an inbuilt kind of spooky element to them. Now, whether the, that constituted in itself, or any of them constituted in itself, a kind of an external influence, would be difficult to say, but after you've worked on a shoot like that for a few weeks, things start to get to you. Thing, you begin to wonder, well, well, why did that light break down? Why did that bulb go? Why did that clock stop? Why did that Ouija board tip over at rehearsals? And were they actually pushing the glass? Or did ultimately, having rehearsed it so often, was the glass taking over anyway? And uh, particularly at the graveyard, and we spent a lot of time in the graveyard, and that in itself is a fairly spooky affair to be doing, you know, at midnight. It was always midnight. You always have to go into a graveyard at midnight. And, you know, you squelch around, very, very bad weather at the time. Your heels sink into, well, let's hope just the edges of graves, but you don't know. Some of the um, experiments uh, in uh, some of the, the mind-bending experiments that we were playing with in some of the other episodes, again, people, some, peop some of the actors started feeling a bit uncomfortable about doing some of the material. Uh, Basically, I think because actors by nature are superstitious, they, uh, you know, <laughs> they, they tend to be, and um, getting themselves into those characters, I suppose they got a bit spooked by, by some of the things that we were asking them to do. Tom? Tom, why is that happening? Can you hear me? Help me. Let's do that. The thing. Oh, oh my God. There were complaints. I mean, I think Mary Whitehouse didn't approve of it uh, because it, it wasn't 
it was to do with the paranormal and she didn't approve of that. Uh, when I heard that uh, Mary Whitehouse had made a personal complaint against this program and saying it was one of the worst things she'd ever seen, it was evil and all those things, um, I must confess that uh, to a large extent, a certain extent, I was flattered because uh, I didn't set out to shock. I've never done that. But I did set out to stimulate and to, uh, to, to, to provoke thought, to make people think, uh, and not just to have something cosy and washing over you, which is really what all of the, the Mary Whitehouses in this world want. You know, they don't want anything that's going to rock the boat. Now, for my, mind, my money, that's not what drama's about. Drama has always been about rocking the boat. It's always been about making people think. And this series was a very good, uh, good opportunity to do just that. I don't think television viewers need a moral guardian because I think most writers, if not all writers, have in their own heads an idea of what they must do and they mustn't do, particularly what they mustn't do. Mary Whitehouse had a point, i.e., where were we? What were we doing? Now, she may have overreacted. She may have been, as she rightly was at the time, a kind of guardian of the public um, mores. Um, but the fact is, and it was irritating, because she used to pop up all over the place. It wasn't just uh, you know, Dennis Potter who got it. Uh, but at the same time, you just, after all, you had to listen. She had a point. And uh, yeah, I would give her, I would say that we did the show, or the shows perhaps, in such a way that there weren't enough big dramatic pyrotechnics to convince the audience that this was our, you know, this was over the top and therefore, you know, who cares? It was sort of a stunt stuff. It was all pretty low key. And because we were doing it in a semi-real or realistic vein <clears throat> or mood, I think Mary had a point, Mary Whitehouse had a point that, uh-oh, this is slightly, or could be, a little bit more disturbing than it should be, because it wasn't a knockabout, well, it's telly, and it's, uh, you know, it's a whodunit, and uh, you know, who killed the crow sort of stuff, and we'll find out next week. It wasn't like that at all. I think it would be very interesting to see what uh, present-day 21st century audiences will make of this uh, quarter of a century old series. Um, in many ways, I hope that they will find it uh, stimulating again, because uh, not enough is being done these days to, to, to make people think. Uh, it's too much, there's too much soap nowadays for my money. And um, I don't think that's what drama's about. I think this is what it should be about. I am proud of my work on the series. It was exciting, it was interesting, and it was slightly different from most television series. I do think it will stand up now, even though some it's studio, it's not film. And I don't know, I haven't seen it, as I say, I haven't seen any of it for about six or seven years because our old videos deteriorated. But I still think that the scripts and the acting and all the work of the technicians stands up. I don't think it's going to be laughable or too old-fashioned. I'd like to see it again. Anyway, I'm looking forward to it.